Welcome back. So this is our second part of building the tool chest. I'm using a plug cutter to for a screw plug uh, that will go and cover the screws and putting it into the drill press here. I like this four prong model um, and what it does is it basically allows you to make your own screw plugs and I sharpened it up uh, just using a diamond file on it and cut as many as you need. Um, you'll see that I do use the same wood. This is a piece of red oak that I used for the project. And that's that way they match, of course, as best they can. So it cuts all the material out away from it. It puts a nice taper on it too, so when you tap it in, um, it will stay in there. I still glue mine, but some people don't glue theirs. When I take them out, you can see the taper on it. It's maybe a two, two degree taper, one two degree taper, um, but just that little bit helps you to start it in the hole and then tap it in uh, to fill those screw holes. A lot of my work, I'll do my case work and cabinet work with um, screws a mechanical fastener and I just like that better. Um, so here you can see I have the 3 8 inch hole drilled in there. I'll put the uh, the glue, you can put it in the hole if it's horizontal or like this if it's vertical, just kind of dab it around there. You can line up the grain for the plug if you want to. Um, sometimes I will line up the grain. Sometimes I'll turn the grain opposite if I want it to be a little more pronounced and, and basically you just tap it in until it stops. I have made these two where you want them even more pronounced. I'll take a piece of cherry, uh, making a stool or a chair out of cherry, and make the screw plugs out of um, like hard maple. So that it's almost a white wood against a really dark orange cherry wood. Looks pretty. What I was saying before is I, I like to use mechanical fasteners um, for this instead of uh, the pocket screws. Um, I know that's a mechanical fastener, but the pocket screws don't tend to grab as well. They grab at an angle. Um, something about them I just don't care for. I think this is stronger. The stuff I've built, some of the stuff over 20 years ago, still sticks together just fine. Um, so I like to have that added. Um, screw head grabbing here and uh, going in. Everyone has their preference and I'm sure these people have built stuff with screw um, pocket screws 20 years ago too. I just tend to like this feel. I also kind of like the craftsman feel too of the look of it where you can see hands have touched it by having these screw plugs in there. Um, they look nice I think in the final wood. So then basically all you have to do is um, find one of these flexible saws. They cost about 10 bucks at most of your home centers. And this is a pull saw. And then you just cut right through there. I have another video to show how I do this, just the screw plugs, but this is a pretty good idea, or a rendition of it too. So then usually once that's done, I'll take a, a nice sharp chisel. It's a pretty old chisel, you can see it still has that laminated steel blade where the part on the bottom is like a high carbon steel, laminated with a less um, high carbon steel, or a less carbon steel um, on the top. One gives it durability and kind of strength. and the high carbon steel on the bottom it gives it a real sharp edge for a long time. I'll still run maybe a little bit of sandpaper over this or most likely I'll use a scraper. Um, not a big fan of sanding if I can get away with it. My shop is indoors so I, I prefer to not do like the big palm sander or do all that indoors. So I try to do as much as I can with a scraper or a file um, or a chisel. They tend to take off larger chunks. That had a few marks left in it. I just take that out with a um, with a scraper, cabinet scraper. So here you can see the carcass. 
You can see I have it on this turntable. That's why when I was cutting it, it was so wobbly. Um, I have this just for demonstration purposes. But you can see what the carcass looks like, and um, the panels are in, and all the rails and styles, and the face frame is secured. So next, in the, uh, the recessed panel sides, I'm going to put some quarter round. This is just a half, a half inch quarter round oak molding. So I'll cut the 45s here. You could cut this on your power miter saw if you want to. Um, sometimes I do it just to hone my skills and try to get better. Um, my, none of my skills are perfect and I still need work. So I practice every now and then. Sometimes I have a few gaps every now and then in my work, and all of this stuff is for me, so I live with it. So then these are the, the pieces that go inside there. Just gives it a nice molded, finished look. And then I'm using my trusty air nailer, making sure that it'll go into both without going all the way through. Looks like I have about a one and a quarter inch there. So I'll put those in, set the air nailer. Usually use about 90 pounds um, PSI. And then just fire a few nails through there. gives you a pretty clean little nail head. Um, you can fill those when you're done with a little bit of putty. Um, sometimes I don't and just when I put the final tongue oil finish on it, it fills it in and it looks just fine. Whatever your preference is. Alright, so I have the, uh, the moldings in and the panels and now I'm going to work on the, the molding on the front here. This is the base of the front. I thought I would just put a nice piece of a 1x2 down here. Miter the corners. And these, since we have a little bit more to grab hold of, I'm going to put screws in from the back side so you don't see any nails in the front. I got these tiny little DeWalt clamps from uh, my kids for birth or for Christmas last year, and uh, they work really well for these small projects. They really hold well, um, and they don't get in the way as much as some of the larger pieces. You see that diagonal piece of pine running. Um, across the bottom there. There's one on the bottom, one on the top, and they oppose each other. <clears throat> uh, one of the pieces of wood, as it kind of dried, um, when I put it together, twisted a little bit. Um, some of the, the styles twisted a little bit, and I had a little bit of a rack in the whole piece when I went to check the diagonals for square. So it was a pretty easy fix. I just dropped a piece of pine in there um, and glued it in and put a couple of screws in there. Um, and it fixed the rack and made it sit perfectly level. I have to do that sometimes. Sometimes the wood that I get isn't perfect. And some of these pieces, like this one, this might have 20, 30, 50% of um, wood from another project in it. And I'm okay with, with doing that when I work for or work on projects for myself. I don't mind if it looks 100% perfect. And, um, So that happens sometimes. So here I was um, drilled the pilot hole, and I'm just going to put a couple of screws through the through the background um, back here, and it'll hold the front front on. I like that it's invisible; just pulls it in against the the face frame, nice and tight. I like a mechanical fastener wherever I um, can put one. 
even if, if it's just a couple of screws. Um, I'll glue some things sometimes, but I have um, I've repaired and refinished a lot of uh, antiques over the years, and I will tell you that anything that um, doesn't have a mechanical <coughs> excuse me anything that doesn't have a mechanical fastener over time um, will most likely come free and whether it's a dovetail drawer um, that has a really really good good tight fit and a lot of surface area there isn't some kind of a mecha mechanical fastener in there it's going to come apart no matter how long it takes um, I know they had inferior glues 100 150 years ago um, but I've even repaired some current things that um, the glue just kind of separated because the wood expands and contracts. So even if you just fire a few pinhole or pin nails in there. So here's the front, um, the, the, the bottom base put on to the cabinet and kind of see a three or almost a 360 degree view of what it looks like. I like that recessed panel. So here's the top. This is a glue up of the top, red oak. This is three, three quarter inch again. And here, some of you would prefer to just grab your router and route the edges, do a round over. That's perfectly fine. Again, I'm inside. I don't want to keep the dust down. Um, so I'll use these little um, round over planes. Uh, the tiny little rosewood one there I bought online. Wasn't that much, maybe 20 bucks. Does a nice job taking it down to about an eighth inch. Um, round over and then the other one you have there which goes all the way up to about a quarter inch um, I made that one out of a piece of soft uh, maple and just a piece of cutting die that I, I bought on online so this takes it down a little bit um, past that 3 16 or 8 8 inch round over that the other one does down to about a quarter inch round over I like that a little better And then here I'm going to do the end grain. The roundover planes don't work so well, you get some chip out. So I tend to just go back to my big um, joiner plane, that block wood that I was using, that antique one. Um, I really like the cutter blade on that and I can hone it to a super sharp edge. So if you just angle it down just a little bit like that um, and cut away from it, it'll cut fine without much chip out at all or without any chip out. And what I'll do is put kind of a chamfer on it first and then round it over with a couple other strokes the other way. And that works pretty well. And then the ends uh, or the corners here, I'll just use a little block plane. Um, you see, you can take off some of those little edges there. If there's, there wasn't really that many, but with this little block plane, I'll just use that to round over the corners. I think the knife puts such a nice edge on there. If I can do a knife edge like this um, versus sanding, I think it looks so much better. Plus, I like that my handmade woodworking looks like hands touched it, and not everything is totally perfect. <clears throat> Alright, so the top is all done, and I put these little corner blocks on. And I will glue the corner blocks, and uh, I'll have to wait and see. I forgot what I did already. Um, I think I put some screws in there and also fired a few nails. So these have one hole. Um, I usually only put one hole in the, or per corner, four corners that'll hold the top on. The hole that I drill in these blocks, um, you can see that I did countersink it. I, I am going to just fire or fire a couple nails in here. I think I have like about a one and a half inch or one and a quarter inch nails we'll put in there. That glue will dry and hold it on there just fine. But the hole that will take a screw down into the top and hold the top on, that hole, um, say if I would normally draw or drill like an eighth inch hole, that hole is probably about a quarter inch or a little bit um, less than that, maybe uh, three sixteenths because I want that screw to be able to move back and forth in there because this top will expand and contract um, across the grain. <clears throat> so when I put the screw in, the screw will be able to kind of um, 
rock back and forth as um, in the winter time the grain will tighten up a little bit as it um, dries out the air dries out and the humidity dries out and it'll contract and then the screws can move and the top won't crack and then when summertime comes again and we have a bunch of humidity in the air from all the green trees um, the top will expand again across that grain and um, let the screw kind of level or lever out the other way So here I'm just going to use that um, that cross member I put in there, that diagonal member, to fix the rack. Um, I'm just going to use that to attach the top on two corners and then put the two little blocks on the other. When I put the little 45 degree block across the, the first thing I put on there, that brace, I was careful not to put too much glue down in there, but if that top's going to expand, it's going to break that glue joint. Um, the wood will move, that's for sure. So here now, this is the underside of the top. I just have it flipped over. Um, this is a more three-quarter round, or no, this is a this is half-inch round, or half-inch quarter round. Um, so this will match what I put in the recessed panels. Um, I like to just give a little bit of a transition here. I also like this because I leave some of the screws open at the top when you join the, the cabinet case together, and then you can just cover them up with this. So this, just miter, miter your corners and fire a few nails in there. I do glue these miter joints so that they hold together a little bit better. If you have trouble sometimes, like I do, when you hand cut your miter joints, um, what you certainly can do is, um, what I'll do sometimes is if I don't have them perfect, I will touch them up on my, uh, on my disc sander. So here I am just simply going to round over the base molding that I have and using a simple little block plane here nothing special this is a block plane that is a Stanley I bought at the home center many many years ago uh, probably cost about $20 um, you keep the blade nice and sharp and it works just fine while I certainly like tools and I appreciate tools you can do pretty much anything with uh, most tools you buy out there if you just keep them sharp I know that you can buy a block plane for $400. Um, that's not in my budget, so this is what I'm going to use. So here I'm just going to take a piece of sandpaper and knock down kind of the wire edges um, in that recessed panel there. This would be hard to do with almost anything, um, so it's just a little bit faster to take a piece of sandpaper and um, take a little bit of that edge off. Not much touch up all these areas. Um, when I have the other wood, like the lumber, um, I don't even sand that. I just put a finish on it and let it be what it was when it came off of the um, the planer, whether it be from the store or whatever. So here I'm just going to put kind of a, a bevel or a, I don't know what I call this, a progressive chamfer on here where it goes down a little bit more in the middle and then comes up toward the ends. And again, just using the block plane um, to knock that down, just to give it kind of an interesting little look and round it over a little bit. <clears throat> so we're starting to wrap up the end of part two here. We're finishing up the, the carcass here, the cabinet base. Here I found this at the home center, this kind of unique little um, cove design piece of molding and um, cut a nice miter on it and we'll just fire tiny little nails in there. This piece was really really delicate so I tried to turn um, 
my air nailer so that it wasn't parallel, it was perpendicular with it. And that, te that tended to help a little bit. I think I just have a little half inch nail in here. Um, so we'll hold it on there and some of these, if you, if you find that when you fire a nail in, it actually breaks it, um, what I'll do sometimes then is just drill a tiny little hole and hand nail these. Uh, but that one seemed to be okay. It didn't break it. Um, I had another area in here, I think, where it kind of cracked the wood, and it looked okay when I finished it. It wasn't that big of a crack. Um, I mixed a little bit of glue with some of the sawdust I had, I think, from the drill or from the sander oak sawdust and filled it in as a wood filler. I tended to look pretty good. So here again we'll glue glue the mitered edge. I see that one mitered edge up there by my thumb has a little bit of a gap in there. Uh, that's one of, I think that's the only one that has a gap on there and it serves me right because that's the one that's in the video most often. But All right, so we'll see you in part three when we'll wrap up the project. Um, we'll do the drawers and install those. Thank you.